We've seen that in the short run, firms are constrained by the short run production function that holds capital fixed at its current level. So firms can produce anywhere along that production function or anywhere below that for that matter. Because if you can use this amount of labor to produce this much output, you can certainly use the same amount of labor to produce less output and produce somewhere down here. But then you wouldn't be fully utilizing all of the labor that you hire. And of course, profit maximizing firms are going to utilize all the labor that they hire. So profit maximizing firms will produce somewhere on the production function. So now let's turn to talking about profit. We're going to denote profit by the letter pi, the Greek letter pi. So that's going to denote profit. And it's just the difference between your revenues and your costs. Firms make revenues by selling output at a certain price. So the price that they can get times how much output they've produced gives us the total revenues for the firm. Profit is equal to revenues minus the firm's costs. And in the short run, the firm's costs are its labor costs. So in the short run, firms are hiring labor hours. So L will stand for labor hours. And they're paying a certain wage. So if we multiply the wage times the number of labor hours they hire, we'll get the total labor cost the firm incurs. Together, we're going to call this the short-run profit. And notice that we don't include the expense on the fixed level of capital that you incur. That's because that expense is already a settled issue. You've already chosen how much capital to have. You can't change that regardless of how much you produce in the short run. So the expense on capital is not a real economic cost for short run production. You have to pay it regardless. You can think of already having paid it and it's not relevant for the short run. The only cost that's relevant in the short run is your labor cost because that's a cost that you can change in the short run by hiring more or fewer workers. Now when you look at this equation, that's the equation of a line. But we want to place that line in this picture. So we want to place that line in a picture where we have x on the vertical axis and labor on the horizontal axis. So to do that, we have to solve for x to get it into the slope-intercept form. So we'll keep the px on one side and then get rid of the wl by adding it to both sides. And then we'll divide by P to get just X. So X is going to be equal to profit divided by price plus W over P times L. So now we have the equation of a line with intercept profit divided by price and slope W over P. So if profit's $100, for example, we would have an intercept of 100 divided by the price. And we'd have a slope of W over P, both W, the wage, and P, the output price, are positive. So we'd have a positive slope, a slope of W divided by P. Now what does that line represent? That line represents all the production plans, all combinations of the input labor and the output X, such that profit is 100. So it represents a profit line, or sometimes it's called an isoprofit line, of all the ways that you could make $100 in profit. If we offered you this production plan versus this production plan, you as a firm would say, I'm indifferent between those two because both of those result in a profit of 100. Here I'm making 100 by hiring relatively little labor and producing relatively little output. Here I'm doing it by hiring a lot of labor and producing a lot of output. But I'm making $100 of profit in either case. Now, suppose profit was a $200 instead. If it was $200, then we'd have an intercept of 200 divided by P. But the slope would still be W over P. We haven't changed W over P. So that would then indicate all the production plans that would result in a profit of $200. Now some of the production plans on these profit lines aren't actually technologically feasible. They lie somewhere out here. 
but nevertheless, if they were feasible, they would result in these profit levels. And you can see that profit increases as we move to the northwest in this graph. As we produce more output, which creates revenues, with less labor, which reduces costs. So we increase profit by moving in this northwest direction. But for every level of profit, there's a profit line that indicates all the production plans that would result in that much profit. There's a line, for example, that crosses this origin. Same slope, but it crosses at zero, so it would contain zero profit. All the combinations of labor and output that produce zero profit. We'd even have some production plans over here. Those lie on a profit line that if we extend this vertical axis would actually result in a negative intercept. So they would contain production plans that result in negative profit. Now what the firm is going to try to do is try to get to the highest possible profit that's technologically feasible. And we can write that mathematically as that the firm is going to try to maximize profit, move to the highest possible profit line by choosing a production plan, LX. But it can't just choose any production plan. It can't choose production plans out here because they're not technologically feasible. So it's going to have to do that subject to the constraint that the output it produces is actually technologically possible given how much labor it hires and the fixed level of capital it has. So now we have the firm's short-run profit maximization problem. Choose a production plan that maximizes profit subject to the technological constraint incorporated in the short-run production function. Graphically, it'll involve moving to the highest possible profit line, highest possible given the technology that we have. And we'll see how that's done next.